I'm Alan Kenny, Editorial Director with REIT.com, and I'm joined by Andy McCulloch, Managing Director and Head of Real Estate Analytics for Green Street Advisors. Andy, I want to ask, Green Street believes that all real estate investors should follow REITs even if they're not in the space. Can you give us an idea of why? Well, thanks, Alan, for having me in today. Um, yeah, I think there's many reasons, but um, first off, when REITs are looking at external growth, uh, they pay a lot of attention to their share price and, and where that share price is relative to the value of their assets. It, if that share price premium is very large, a REIT is incentivized to go out and issue equity and go buy stuff. It, it essentially creates arbitrage. On the flip side, if they're trading at a big discount, they're incentivized to sell assets and buy back their stock. So if I'm a private market participant and I'm out competing against a REIT to maybe buy deals, or maybe I'm even looking to buy something from a REIT, uh, I'm paying very close attention to where they're trading relative to NAV because it gives me insight into what the REIT's true motivations are. Do they really want to be a net buyer or a net seller? Uh, as an example, if a REIT's trading at a gigantic premium to NAV, they are incentivized and can go out and essentially overpay for an asset. If I'm a private guy competing against them, that, that's valuable information for me to know. The second reason is that, and it's a very simple one, is that the REIT market is a very good predictor of private market asset values. If REITs trade uh, at a big premium for a prolonged period, private market asset values tend to rise. If REITs trade at a discount for a prolonged period, private market asset values tend to fall. So if I'm a pr private market investor, uh, REIT pricing is just another tool in my toolkit that I'll use to assess uh, private market asset values going forward. And you mentioned those asset valuations. Obviously, we've seen real estate on a real tear recently. Uh, how do the valuations right now compare to uh, the peak, you know, around 2007? And where do you see valuations going in the future? Uh, sure. Um, Green Street produces what we call commercial property price indices, or CPPIs. Uh, and really what those indices do is they simply track the direction of asset values. Uh, what we see in our indices is that asset values for all the major property sectors are at or above 2007 levels. Uh, for certain property types like malls and apartments, asset values are well above 2007 levels, 20 to 30 percent above. Uh, for office and hotels, asset values are, are about back to 2007 levels, and the other major property types are somewhere in between. Uh, when we see, you know, when, when we think about where asset values are going to go uh, going forward, really what we're looking at is expected returns on real estate. And when you look at expected returns on real estate today, they look, they may look skinny in an absolute sense, uh, but relative to the fixed income market, specifically corporate uh, and government bonds, uh, they actually look attractive. And if you look at that spread uh, between expected returns on real estate and fixed income, it's historically wide. And what we think that means is that that spread will put downward pressure, continued downward pressure on cap rates and upward pressure on asset values. And Green Street's published quite a few reports recently on capital expenditures. Give us an idea, what are your main takeaways? What's so interesting in the real estate space is that real estate investors have these rules of thumb that they use about what an appropriate level of, of CapEx is. Uh, and what we find is those rules, are, rules of thumb are dramatically too low. Uh, what we also find is that CapEx reserves or CapEx requirements vary dramatically across property types. So if most real estate investors underestimate CapEx, and that us underestimation varies by property type, well, that creates systematic mispricing in the market. And what that means for us, it's really from a capital uh, allocation standpoint, uh, is because of this misunderstanding and underestimation of CapEx, we believe investors uh, should overweight low CapEx property types. Well, what are examples of low CapEx property types? Apartments, uh, self-storage, and actually manufactured housing. Many people think trailer parks when they think of manufactured housing, uh, but from a risk-adjusted return perspective, it, it's really an attractive property sector. Well, Andy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And for more on this and other REIT news and analysis, be sure to visit REIT.com.